this event is sponsored by the China Research Center, and our topic today is the war in Ukraine, what it means for China. And I think it's going to be a great topic since the war has been going on for over six months, unfortunately. And we want to, uh, so, but now we have some space to observe how um, China has reacted and, and what their responses have been. Our panelists are Dr. Yahweh Lil, Senior Advisor on China for the Carter Center and Associate Director of the China Research Center. Dr. John Gibbons, Professor of Political Science, Spelman College and Associate of the China Research Center. And Dr. Andy Weidemann, Professor of Political Science, Georgia State University, and also an associate of the China Research Center. If our um, audience wants to see more in-depth bios from them, you can go to the China Research Center website at chinacenter.net. Um, so just a little housekeeping. I have some questions, which I will start asking and if the audience can put their questions in the chat i will start asking those after i ask a few of mine and if your question is directed to one of the panelists in particular please also try to note that in the chat thank you for doing that um, so just let me emphasize that's the chat not the q a section um Let's go ahead and start. So I'll read my first question. So uh, everyone, last week, uh, Putin and she met for the first time in, as they keep saying in the press, uh, over a thousand days. Um, oh no, but P Putin went to China in between. So I wanted to get our panelists' comments first on the meeting and the what both Putin and Xi's um, readouts said that they agreed on or didn't agree on, because I think there were some interesting comments there. Um, so if you guys can comment on what you see China has learned so far from uh, the war in Ukraine, I would appreciate that. Should we start with Dr. Weidemann, since you were the last in the introductions? Um, I, I... I tend to not put a lot of stock into to the readouts. Um, you know, they're basically public relations uh, documents designed to. They, they certainly communicate messages, but I think the, I think the more important message that, that I took away is they met. It wasn't all that uh, dramatic a meeting, and given the way the war has shifted in the past uh, week or so, I would imagine that Xi Jinping is simply. Uh, he's going through a formality and doesn't want to commit one or one way or the other because he certainly doesn't, you know, doesn't want to be backing Putin if Putin is going is going to go is uh, facing potential defeat, and possibly uh, political trouble at home. So I think I think the takeaway message is that China continues to take this standoff, wait and see attitude toward the conflict. Mm -hmm. Great, Yahweh, did you have any? Additional comments on that topic? Yeah, I, I think the Western interpretation of that public statement made by President Putin and made by President Xi are quite uh, extraordinary. And me, myself, I, I think they are also significant. Of course, we don't know what has transpired behind the scene. You know, to what extent the China has asked President Putin to acknowledge that China has questions and concerns about the war in Ukraine. You know, if I were Putin, I'm not gonna go out there and publicize the difference between Beijing and Moscow. The fact that President Putin did that, I, I think he probably was pressured by China to do that because this basically add more weight to China's statement that China is neutral on this issue. You know, China is not actively supporting the war in Ukraine. But of course, you know, I also agree with, with Andy that we cannot take this uh, interpretation too far because before the meeting, there was another meeting is the chairman of the standing committee of the National People's Congress, Li Danshu. You know, he met with uh, Putin and then he also met with his counterpart, 
of the Russian Duma. Now the Russian propaganda apparatus made the point to basically publish what he told the chairman of the Duma, not only putting out the transcript, they also released a video. And that video about what he told his counterpart in the Russian Duma is also very significant. So you see, on the one hand, it is important. On the other hand, again, I don't think we can go too far in terms of indicating that there is a change on China's position. I'll stop here. Great. And John, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I just say I, I agree with both uh, uh, Andy's point that it's hard to know uh, what to make of these things. It's hard to you know read um, uh, uh, stuff into them. I think you know you kind of you end up doing some like classic tea leaf reading, Kremlinology kind of stuff, which I'm not particularly trained at or good in. But but you do want to kind of look at things that are not said as sometimes being more important than things that are said, right? Because um, the language tends to be pretty boilerplate. And so I think in this case, it did seem for me from the official statements that statements that China still, you know, wants to kind of have its place shaping the uh, the global environment, the the rules of the game, the future of of the global system. But it's backed off a little from being like, and our great partner in this is Russia, right? Because the optics of that aren't wonderful now. So they haven't said, you know, we're not supporting Russia, but they've kind of I think backed off a little on that. And I think. Um, uh, to, to both uh, my colleagues' points, it's because they're kind of waiting to see how it plays out, right? There's no ad advantage to China to going all in supporting Russia, um, and uh, they can just, they, they, the best stance for them is just to stay on the fence, which is, I think, where they are, really. I would just add to that, that actually, uh, the Russians doing poorly is to China's advantage, because it basically uh, creates a situation where if Putin, you know, coming out of the war, if Putin is completely isolated and faced with a hostile West, um, uh, Russia becomes the little brother in the relationship, and uh, she has much more leverage over him if if China uh, remains uh, Russia's kind of lukewarm friend in, a, in, a, in an increasingly hostile environment. Right. Um, and so we've got a question that speaks to this in particular. Um, the question is, is, is this a game played by the Chinese side? Because if you look at business flows and um, unreported support, the story could be very different. Um, and I think that is one thing that I've speculated about in terms of um, looking at this from the export controls and the sanctions and is china able to you know secretly send stuff to russia that they need um and was that sort of the the meeting just a way to kind of gloss over that okay um i, I think if you're talking about playing game i i think russians are much better playing this game than, than China. Uh, Russia has managed successfully to entrap China at the very beginning to get China and uh, Russia to sign that no limit sort of partnership, you know, that long marathon document. Uh, I, I think uh, Russia also played the game of deliberately describing how wonderful this relationship is. If you look at Putin's speech, you know, uh, on September the 15th, you know, he said, in the past six months, you know, so many things have changed in the world, but one thing that hasn't changed, you know, that is the friendship between Moscow and, and Beijing. And Russia has also played the game of publicizing what I think China side doesn't want Moscow to publicize. That is what uh, Li Zhanshu, the chairman of the standing committee of the NPC said, you know, to his counterpart. So Russia is playing this game very, very good. and. Uh, I don't think China can send material support that meant to support the war without being discovered. Mm -hmm. You know, nowadays, uh, and and the U.S. is, is you know has a human asset as well as satellite and other means you know to monitor that. So China is very careful. I, I don't think China really wants to get itself involved in being proved that it is sending material support for the war effort. Uh, in Ukraine. 
yeah, that's a, an interesting aspect too. And I noted in some articles over the weekend that um, there's there is evidence that Iran has been sending weapons to Russia. And I think if Russia had a choice, they would probably prefer Chinese ones. But um, so that kind of to me shows that that China's still standing back, as you guys say. Um, on the other I, 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 on the other hand, by maintaining trade and exports to uh, to Russia, they're actually aiding the war effort because they're lessening the, the impact of the Western sanctions. But again, they're not doing any. You know, I, they're they're doing things to lessen the lessen the impact. But I don't see them sending you know, a weapon. I think the North Koreans. Yeah, and I think I think I think it's also this is the this is the international legal regime, international legal system, international system that China wants, which is a system where um, if a big power like China or Russia decides that its neighbor has to be invaded, there are minimal consequences, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily have to give Russia guns, but it certainly doesn't want a system where human rights violations, um, uh, uh, acts of aggressive war, and other things are punished by a well-organized, effective, uh, you know, uh, international system, right? Um, and whether that's that's for all the, I think, obvious reasons, whether it's a, you know, a potential invasion of Taiwan or um, uh, actions in Xinjiang or, or Tibet, right? Right, yeah, and that kind of gets to, to the second question that I wanted to ask, which is the overarching question is, um, what messages is China taking um, in terms of the the power shifts in in the world that happened because of of the the war and how in specific um china's policy of non-interference in internal um issues right which is a little bit different in russia's claiming that ukraine belongs to them but for you know 30 plus years they've been recognized as a country on their own. Um, I wonder if you guys can comment on, on what messages China is taking in terms of the kind of world order that they want to see. Who wants to start? Yeah. I, I think the question should be asked the other way around is, mm -hmm. is that by uh, su supporting, not supporting, but by justifying Russia's war against Ukraine, you know, what is the message that the outside world is, is getting uh, mm -hmm. from, from China? I, I, I remember, you know, before the war, the Chinese foreign minister and state counselor Wang Yi was at the Munich Security Conference, and he basically said uh, political sovereignty and territorial integrity, you know, they're the most important principles of any country's foreign policy, and this is applicable to Ukraine. Now, by saying that Russia acted almost like in self-defense, uh, by saying that, or by implying that Russia is justified in invading Ukraine uh, because NATO is pushing uh, way too hard uh, on Russia, uh, China has weakened its position on the sanctity of this very important foreign policy principle, you know, that is political sovereignty and territorial integrity. And, and I think that if, if we're going to sort of do the assessment, you know, the, this is the worst uh, damage in, in terms of China's moral position. You know, th this hurts China the most. That, that's my uh, sense. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would follow that by saying that uh, the Western response and the American response has to be uh, very un unsettling to the Chinese. In some ways, this is like the 1991 Gulf War, where George Bush took a stand and rallied uh, the coalition of, I think it was the coalition of the willing. Um, and, you know, the, you know, basically the U.S. led an effort to evict Saddam Hussein's forces from Kuwait. I think in the run-up to the war, um, given what the past two presidents have done, uh, Obama with Crimea and then Trump with uh, well with Trump with everything. Um, I think the, I think the Ch Chinese could have well anticipated, and clearly the Russians certainly anticipated that the West would um, 
you know, raise a hue and cry and then uh, do absolutely nothing. In fact, quite the opposite has happened. Uh, the Americans have convinced their allies and friends to donate weapons and help the British. Um, and, you know, they, they've taken a very daring position, particularly given Russia's control over energy uh, exports to, to Western Europe. And so I think for China, uh, this is a setback in the sense that the, the, quote, declining America suddenly has stood back up um, and has taken a, and been able to assume a leadership role. So I think, you know, I, I think to me, that's the more, that's, you know, probably the biggest message that they get from the response to the, the Ukraine war. I'd also add that the, the fact that it's going badly for the Russians, uh, at the moment at least, uh, has got to give Xi pause about, the, about using military forces, particularly his own, which are not tried and hardened in any kind of combat. And I believe that I read an article over the weekend suggesting they have you know, serious problems with uh, combined uh, arms uh, operations because they simply don't have a lot of uh, inter-service inter, inter uh, tra uh, uh, training. I'll stop. Yeah. John, did you want to comment? Yeah, mm -hmm. just, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with all that. And I think uh, there's, you know, there's the fairly, obvious point i'm not sure if anyone's made it but i'll, I'll go ahead and, and and make it is that um obviously russia has been uh dramatically less successful than people had anticipated right um and that this has marked a uh probably a change in taiwanese strategy that's meaningful right and probably really uh uh strategic and, and tactically superior which is okay we may not meet uh, as many chinese jets uh on the air over the taiwan straits um we may not meet their boats with other boats uh, but what we, we can do is make every inch of sea and land miserable with high mars and rocket uh, and, and drones um and these types of weapons which is what ukraine has really modeled for them right um and so 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 on the one side we've raised the cost uh presumably uh, well okay if you're if you're a bayesian right it's statistically we've updated our priors on how painful military militarily this is going to be for china um and on the other side we've um seen action that hopefully will convince Chinese leaders that this is going to be fairly painful for them as well, the kind of sanctions that we can employ, right? And, you know, we can do, we, uh, I say we, uh, in general, uh, the West probably can't cut off China as easily as we can cut off Russia, right? Um, uh, Russia has a lot of control over energy, but that's a fungible commodity, right? We don't care if we get our energy. Energy from Russia is the same as energy from the Middle East. It's the same as energy from South America, right? Um, but microchips, electronics, um, all this kind of stuff we depend on China for that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, um, these supply chain issues being so vital. Um, these are going to be harder to replace, which is why I think, um, you know, and, and I advocate in my paper for sanctions as specifically targeted and as um you know, impactful as possible on Russia's leadership, right? Um, uh, let's 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 do everything to make uh, Russia's leaders not want to support this kind of endeavor, and uh, you know, hopefully by analogy and by example, show China's leaders that they also shouldn't be supporting this kind of thing, right? And in fact, maybe should be raiding in Xi a little bit, right? Xi has consolidated his power massively. Um, the common uh, wisdom seems to be he can kind of do what he wants now. And this is, uh, for those who don't, don't follow Chinese domestic politics closely, this is a big change, right, to have a leader. Because it used to be um, the leader of the, uh, of the CCP was kind of the first among equals, right? There were other balancing factors. Now this doesn't seem to be the case. And so um, to encourage people to say, hey, if she starts to get out there, you need to be able to rein him in. And I think, so everything from keeping Russian athletes out of Wimbledon uh, to keeping uh, the uh, children of Russian leaders out of top Western universities, which I think will be really impactful for Chinese leaders to see, right? I mean, Xi Jinping's daughter went to Harvard. Um, to know that they won't have access to that anymore, I think could could maybe mean something. Um, so I, may, maybe I'm over kind of stepping the bounds, and I, I hope Yahweh and uh, Andy will, will call me out if, 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 I, if I've been a little too grandiose, but uh, that's kind of the vision that I see. Yeah, that's interesting. And um, Yahweh and Andy, did you have any further comments? John sort of leads into the economic issues, you know, economic impacts on on everyone, really. Um, and 
how China is viewing that. Can you comment on that a little? I, I think the impact on China's uh, economic development, you know, just the war itself is is uh, less uh, than you know the zero COVID uh, policy in 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 China. Uh, if you know, I, I read uh, Putin's speech that was released uh, by by Kremlin. It's very interesting. He's trying to highlight, you know, the Russia China trade relationship. You know, he said. Uh, Basically, at this point, the, the Russia-China trade volume is at about $160 billion. And he said, very soon, uh, it will surpass uh, $200 billion. But you know, if you look at the trade volume, you know, even with the tariff war, trade war going on between US and China is getting close or uh, surpassing $700 billion. So it, you know, the Russia-China trade and uh, Russia, U.S. China trade. You know, there's just no comparison here. Uh, the impact, of course, on European countries is is much uh, bigger. You know, particularly uh, with with the pipeline cut off. You know, Germany and and now United Kingdom uh, and all the others. You know, the inflation uh, and all that. You know, I, I I think this will impact how long uh, the Western bloc is going to remain. United, you know, one economic uh, pressure uh, is is going to uh, make people suffer. Is going to lower the living conditions of of, of the people in Europe. But uh, people, of course, are very much relieved to see over the weekend Germany, uh, which has been very reluctant to send uh, Ukraine weapons, made another decision to send new weapons to Ukraine. Yeah, I think you know. The I follow Yahweh in saying that the, the economic impact is fairly complicated in that uh, the cutoff, the, the, while John is right that, you know, it doesn't, you know, in some ways Russian oil is, is the same as, as Saudi oil, et cetera, but it affects the price of oil. And so with decreased supply, leads to increased prices, helps fuel inflation, which is also due to supply chain problems which are actually linked into uh, COVID zero and the disruption of the Chinese domestic economy, uh, the impact on production and uh, exports. So I think I think Yahweh is right that um, it'll be interesting how long the West will continue to stand uh, together and with Ukraine in, in, during the winter, because this is going to be where the biggest impact is going to be because of the the loss of energy of the or well the increased price of uh, energy uh, you know it's pretty cold in germany in the winter uh, and so i i think that's you know when people start really feeling it in the pocketbook and feeling it when their their thermostats are turned way down um, that's when i think you know it'll be interesting to see if the west hangs together but of course what you've got is how you know what's going to happen in the next weeks on the front um, if the Russian forces continue uh, to collapse, then, you know, literally Russia could be at the point of having to uh, start looking for a face-saving exit, um, and Mr. Putin could be in trouble. So that, you know, by the winter, Russia could be desperate to, uh, to unload supplies of energy um, and do so uh, to the advantage of Western Europe. I guess we just say Europe now. Right. Yeah. Or the EU. Um, and one one of our our audience members brought up this issue, which is also, uh, you know, as you say, the economic picture is complicated, and this speaks to it because the war is creating a crisis in with food prices and the availability of food, especially in in um, Africa, but also potentially in China since they import a lot of um, food. So. I think uh, over the summer, China didn't see much of a of an inflationary impact. But this audience member is saying that if if this goes on too long, China could also see a ride, rise in food prices. Um, do you think that could change at least the public um, support for Russia? That's a good question because of the drought in the drought in the, in the West and in the Midwest. Um, 
it's not just the loss of Ukrainian grain, but if U.S. exports or uh, supplies are down, that'll contribute further to uh, to rising food prices, which we're seeing here in the United States already. I mean, you already have shortages in the U.S. I went to buy spring onions the other day, and the store only gets one case a day. Uh, so the woman said, "Get get here at eight o'clock," and I was reminded of uh, shopping in the Soviet Union. Uh, when we were there for a, couple, a short period of time. Actually, we arrived in the Soviet Union, we left Russia. Um, you know, we simply couldn't get things. And to have that happen in the US, I suggest, you know, the impact is of the economic side is going to grow over time. And, you know, it, rising prices in China combined with the unrest with COVID zero, um, you know, Xi Jinping may be the be in charge of everything, but he may not be in control of everything. Mm. Yeah, that's a good observation too. Um, does anyone else want to comment on the John or Yahweh on the economic impact or potential economic impact? I, I, I think China is going through uh, economic recession, if not a, a crisis. So it's not just you know the what happened in, in Russia. You know, uh, food security is a global problem. And, you know, for China, I, th I think at this point, uh, China and India they actually have had a windfall because they can buy Russian oil at a huge discount because Russia can now sell them elsewhere. And by the same token, China and India probably can also buy food uh, from Russia. You know, wheat and others at at the discount. That that's not going to be a big problem. A big problem. In, in China is, you know, is the real estate market, is the rising debt issue, it's, it's the supply chain issue, it's, it's the unemployment of, of the college uh, grad, you know, all of these are going to be combined, you know, to, to make the leadership of, of China or the new leadership under the same old uh, top leader, you know, next year, you know, face a, a, a crisis they probably have uh, never encountered uh, in, in the past uh, four, four decades. And, and that's going to be a crisis. It's not just linked uh, to what's going on uh, in, in, in Ukraine. It's more than that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think to that point, I, I think this is the real, uh, I mean, it always is the $64 million question. China grew for about 10% for three decades. It's unprecedented in human history. Um, uh, it, they can't sustain it forever, but the question has, continues to be: When does the other shoe drop? Um, does it is, is it a, is it a soft landing or a hard landing? Right, and we, we never know. Um, uh, it, it does. There do seem to be signs that maybe it's it's dropping soon. Maybe it's going to be a harder landing. Um, uh, but but we sh you know I, I just um, I want to be not yeah I mean it, it's just so difficult to predict right and there's been so, there's a there's a field of people that have, have made predictions about China's decline um, or crash that, that that haven't happened and one of the reasons I think is the Chinese state has a lot of capacity and a lot of willingness to do things uh, I mean look at their look at their COVID response now uh, I think there's a lot of legitimate criticisms of it but they have managed to keep people indoors in big cities for you know months at a time it's 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 almost an unprecedented level of control and there hasn't been i mean there are people that are dissatisfied for sure but it hasn't been any sort of outright rebellion right in fact i think uh support for the state re remains pretty high as far as we're aware so it's pretty mm -hmm. remarkable so whether it's a a debt crisis or real estate price crisis i think the state it, it i should say it's still possible the state will bail, will bail them out right and i think that's always going to be the question is 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 this beyond the capacity of the chinese state to deal with um but to my mind, as Yahweh said, it's it's not any one of these things. It's right. a whole combination, and the fact that uh, all none of these things are easy to control. I mean, they've been fighting COVID zero. Uh, how long can they sustain that? They have the trade war with the United States. They've got the Ukraine crisis. Um, you've got all of these things going on, and um, you, you do wonder at some point will the combination of inflation, COVID zero. Declining, unemployment, declining employment for youth, at what point does that begin to hit home and to hit home at the base of the Communist Party itself, its membership and the middle class? Uh, as Yahweh, as I, I think John said, 
you know, what are they, what, what happens when the middle class finds that their kids can't go to the college overseas, that uh, they can't find jobs, um, that they've been locked in for, for months at a time, that food prices are rising, and then you add all the other problems like inflation and so forth. Um, you know, it, it, if I'm going to the 20th Party Congress, it's it's not a rosy picture out there by any by any means. Mm -hmm. um, yes, agreed. Um, so let's shift for a minute to Taiwan um, and the impact of, of Russia's actions in Ukraine. Uh, because a couple of questions have come up about that, and I, I particularly like the way one is worded, so I'm going to read that. From the perspective of the U.S., what experience and lessons should be drawn from the Ukraine war to avoid a war in the Taiwan Strait? And then, from the perspective of China, what should the Chinese do to avoid war? So we're assuming that both sides want to avoid war, which I think is true as well. well and Andy, do you want to make the excellent point you made in the paper about Xi Jinping playing defense and how mm -hmm. a lot of this is an attempt to avoid war, even though it's not how we might interpret it? Yeah, yeah I, I think the, the important thing to me is you've got to figure out what Xi Jinping, what his game is. Is he playing offense in the sense that he's trying to ratchet up the pressure on Taiwan to move it, uh, you know, to make it move toward, uh, toward reunification or possibly into uh, possibly to be reunification, or is he playing as uh, John actually in his paper also said? Is he continuing to play defense in the sense that while it would be wonderful to be the man who recovered Taiwan, it would be absolutely catastrophic to be the man who lost Taiwan. And you know, to my mind, what this comes down to is: Do you think he's playing offense or defense? If he's playing offense then the Western response uh, would lead you to think he would be, you know, the, the deterrence level has gone up, or that he now recognizes that he has to ratchet the pressure up even further. The problem with ratcheting up the pressure is if you end up getting into a conflict, um, probability of winning is probably not all that great, particularly if the U.S. gets involved. As John noted earlier, in order to launch an invasion of Taiwan, you have to gain control over the sea, the undersea, and the air. That's all before you can launch an operation against Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is playing defense, not offense. The defense uh, usually has a one has a one to three advantage in that um, you know it's it's easier to sit in bunkers and shoot down planes and try and take the bunkers out from the planes. Um, so I think, you know, I think in some ways, um, I, I think at the end of the day, the calculation comes down to, do I think I'm gonna win or do I think there's a significant risk of losing? Of course, uh, that's a matter of, of assessment. Um, that's a matter of what your generals and admirals tell you. And I think one of the lessons uh, from the, from Russia's war in Ukraine is don't trust the generals uh, completely because they, they completely bungled it. Um, you know, Xi Jinping has got a military where he's replaced a lot of personnel because the uh, military was shot through with corruption. It's an army that hasn't fought a real war since the Korean War. Um, it's also, uh, you know, it, it's got all these new toys, but the new toys are only as good as the people operating them and the people that are operating them are only as good as the people who are commanding it. So I would turn around and say, you know, if, I, if I'm sitting in Zhongnanhai, I, mean, I of course really don't know what Xi Jinping is being told, and I don't know his, his aversion uh, to risk. Uh, but I would say, you know, that even today with all the new weaponry, the, the odds of winning a war with Taiwan are not nearly 100%. And so then what he's got to do is contemplate is, well, what if I get defeated? What if it gets thwarted? And I become, you know, because if, if Taiwan throws back an attack, you know the first thing it's going to do is declare independence. And if it, in that situation, the United States would probably very quickly move to recognize it because, in effect, the, the Chinese have proven to be a paper tiger. So my own sense is that actually Xi Jinping is on the defense. 
because what he's worried about is what we've seen is an ever increasingly close relationship between Washington and Beijing. Uh, excuse me, Taiwan. Um, began with the Trump administration. You know, clearly people like Pompeo and others uh, support a new relationship with Taiwan. Nancy Pelosi as well. So there's kind of a bipartisan push to to deepen the relationship. And for Xi, I think that means he needs to deter, he needs to remind everybody that if you cross the line, it's going to be a bloody mess, but I don't want to get into it. So, you know, I increase the pressure to try and signal, I don't think he really cares about what Taipei thinks. I think he cares about what Washington thinks. And what he's got to do is convince the Biden administration and people in Congress that, yes, Taiwan is democracy and there are all sorts of good reasons to recognize it, but is it worth the downside? Do we really want to get into a conflict between two, the two largest nuclear armed powers in the world? And I think in the end of the day, neither side wants it. But as I said earlier, I mean, there's a problem of how, how well could you control events? And I think the problem for Xi and the problem for Biden is both that you can do things, but you can't control things. Yeah, that's a good comment. So I want to ask a follow-up question based on a comment you made earlier, which was that um, you didn't think that she expect, or that sorry, that Putin didn't expect um, the U.S. or the EU to respond in such a strong way. He thought he'd roll on into Kiev with little opposition. Um, if that had happened, if, if Russia had successfully um, executed and taken over Ukraine, do you think that would have, um, without any Western opposition, with if the West had just sort of um, called out a few things and then not actually done anything, um, do you think that would have been a different message to China? And that, do you think that would have um, made China act on Taiwan in a different way? Well, I think I think if the Russians had just rolled in, the Ukrainians had just thrown up their arms and surrender, I think that would be very different, um, you know, in the sense that uh, the West literally wouldn't have any time to respond. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what, what Putin was hoping. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, th there are kind of two, th a couple of things I take as takeaways from, from the way the war developed is, First, the Russians bungled it. They didn't really have a good, you know, they just didn't execute well. But more important, the Ukrainians responded in a way that was kind of unexpected and almost levé en masse, where, you know, people are swarming in to, to volunteer for the forces. Uh, there's clearly a very strong will to resist. And Putin, I mean, he has to worry about that in the case of Taiwan also. Would the, you know, is it possible that the Taiwanese on their own could, you know, throw back a uh, major attack without having to have the West come in? And again, this all becomes a, a matter of, you know, a, a Bayesian, you know, you, you're constantly updating what you think and what the probabilities are. But at the end of the day, you don't know the probabilities. You're just guessing. And as I said earlier, uh, you don't want to be the guy who guessed wrong and end up being the man who lost Taiwan. Uh, I would assume that she she probably could not survive uh, that kind of an outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say if you have to assess the gains and losses on, on the China part, I, I think on the Taiwan issue, China probably has lost the, the most because of its uh, support of the war in Ukraine. Because it literally by doing so, China is handing a blank check to the U.S. Uh, on the Taiwan issue. So if you look at now where China is on, on the Taiwan issue, you know the the, the Taiwan Policy Act uh, is basically being uh, out of the committee in the in the Senate. You know Biden sent a, a high caliber delegation to Taiwan in immediately after the invasion. You know it's uh, kind of like a Truman. Uh, dispatching the Seventh Fleet after North Korea invaded the South Korea. Uh, although, you know, sending a high caliber delegation to Taiwan was, was not as serious as 
dispatching the seventh fleet. But in the long run, you know, Biden and, and others, they're able to use the Russian invasion of Ukraine to highlight the possibility of China using force against Taiwan. So they are able to rally. You know, European Parliament over the weekend, last week, just overwhelmingly passed a resolution on the Taiwan issue. I mean, European countries really do not want to be drawn into this issue. Now, NATO and, and EU, they're all uh, on this issue. So that, that's one side. The other side, I, I think uh, Andy has talked a lot, is uh, I, I think it's uh, the only, maybe the silver lining uh, uh, of the uh, cloud is this is going to uh, convince the top leadership in China. You know, once you consider using force against Taiwan to, to do your reunification thing, you got to think not only twice, three times, four times, or five times before you're going to use it because there are so many variables in this formula. And, and look at what Ukraine is capable of doing. Not only they themselves can fight, but with tremendous support from, from the West. You know, until China has uh, answers to the questions I have listed in my, in my paper, I don't think they're going to do it. So that, that's the silver lining, I, I think, even though at a very high cost of, of the Ukraine lives and, and the Russian lives. And also, I think it's a blow to many in China who say taking Taiwan by force is as easy as that. You know, I heard a scholar say, you know, the military, the generals told the top leadership, if you issue the order at seven o'clock by four o'clock, we're gonna turn over Taiwan to you. I, I, th I think that kind of conviction uh, has, has evaporated a lot. Oh. And I, I think to, to build off that uh, uh, excellent point, Yahweh, I think China has dug itself a little bit of a hole because they've, uh, this is kind of the popular perception in China. They've put this message out there for a long time. We could conquer Taiwan, no big deal. Um, and, and Putin just figured out that that's, when you set the bar that high, right, you've really set yourself up for failure, right? And so, uh, and especially when you consider that Taiwan's terrain is, is brutal to attack versus Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is literally flat plains, right? Taiwan is Normandy again, right? It's it's beaches with cliffs on them. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, it's a little more complicated than that, but Taiwan is much uh, more rugged terrain, more difficult to attack. And so if you don't set the bar, if, you, if you're setting the bar really low, it makes the consequences of it not going well higher. And it also makes it function less well as a sort of distraction, right? If um, these these kind of uh, negative consequences that, that that both Andy and Yahweh pointed out are coming to China, right? Uh, if a uh, slowing economy, debt crisis, whatever, and they want to distract from that, right? There's a classic tactic in international relations, the idea of the diversionary war, right? Well, if the diversionary war goes really badly, you've just created another problem on the list. You haven't, it hasn't done it, what it's meant to do. And if you didn't set the bot, if you didn't set people's expectations to say, this is going to be a long and tough slog, now you've, you've made things worse for yourself. Um, and then, but just uh, so that I wanted to build up that, but then to go back to that comment, what, what would have happened if Putin had had better luck in the Ukraine? I think that's where it really comes back to me. It is what did we make the international consequences? Because if, if, if Putin had really rolled into the Ukraine, he rolled into Kiev the, the second day, right? And these, these, all these Russians that had brought their dress uniforms for the victory parade had got to use them and they were still nicely pressed, right? Um, uh, I mean, that, that's awful in a lot of ways, but does the West then make the, Russia suffer for a decade because of this, for two decades, for three decades, or is it all over in six months, right? So, so I think the lesson w is uh, there is not, uh, we, we have this now additional military lesson, which I think is really helpful for d protecting Taiwan, but even if we lacked it, what's the, what's the political will of the rest of the world um, to, to create consequences here? Um, and they're going to be harder to create in Taiwan because Taiwan does not have the clear legal status that Ukraine does, right? Um, nobody is is legally arguing that Taiwan is a separate country from China, whereas Ukraine, uh, it has been a separate country for 30 years. It was a member of the United Nations. Russia agreed that it was a separate country, et cetera. Yeah, that's one interesting comment. I think I can't remember if it was you, John, or Andy that wrote in your paper, um, actually, some something about the in fact, it's Taiwan that's learned a lot of lessons from the Ukraine invasion 
Um, so maybe we should look at it just for a, sh a minute on what Taiwan has taken away from this um, invasion of Ukraine. I, I think the lesson for, for Taiwan, uh, of course, is you know, it's your homeland that you, you have to defend it. And I, I, I think what happened in Ukraine and how Ukrainians are able to respond has made Taiwanese to really consider you know, what uh, an invasion would, like, would look like and, and you know, they, they need to defend themselves. Do not expect uh, other boots you know, on the ground uh, you have to do it yourself, at least initially. Of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, China. One big, one of the big losses on, uh, for China is the issue of Taiwan. So, if you watch uh, 60 Minutes last night, uh, clear and loud, President Biden made the fifth statement that U.S. is going to militarily intervene if uh, mainland China uses force. You know, this this is. A, a direct consequence of, of China's support of, of, of Ukraine, even though the White House once again said you know, U.S. policy on Taiwan has not changed. I, I, I think it has now changed beyond uh, recognition. Yes, that is one of the questions that um, was asked as well. Uh, more specifically um, related to Biden's comments defending Taiwan yesterday. Um, the question is, what do you think um, that means or what could the implications be? Um, so just look, maybe expanding on what Yahweh just talked about. In some ways, I don't think this is a new, it, it necessarily is a new position. The U.S. has long indicated that if the Chinese unilaterally attack Taiwan, we might come to their aid. And of course, you know, you can say it on 60 Minutes, but you know, there's always a question of will you actually do it. And I think the one thing about uh, the Ukraine crisis, it signaled that Biden is willing to do it. And so that the, the word is not, well, maybe if and, you know, given the circumstances, it's, it's a pretty unambiguous, uh, uh, you know, that we will come to their aid. There was a, a sentence I saw later, though, that said that it's up to Taiwan to make choices about its future. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, remember the other side of strategic ambiguity was telling the Taiwanese that if you provoke the Chinese into uh, attacking by declaring independence, well, that's that may be a different story and don't be so sure that, that we are gonna stand by you there. So that's, I mean, not to me, there hasn't really been a, a big shift, but what, what has changed over the past you know, decade or so is, you know, those informal agreements that are informal expectations built into the Shanghai communicate, the three communiques, um, that we would not, that we would maintain a hands-off official relationship. I think a lot of that has eroded. And so I think, you know, that what the Chinese see is that you know, the United States in a kind of salami slicing manner is moving to the point where, uh, you know, we'll wake up one day and we'll have an embassy, uh, you know, we'll have diplomatic relations. We won't call it that, but, you know, the relationship will have been rebuilt. And then, then the question for Xi becomes, what happens if the U.S. and the Taiwanese make a unilateral declaration of independence? Established relations. What follows from that? Can I afford to have a cutoff of trade to the United States? Can I f afford to, you know, to try and carry through with my threats? I think so. As I said in the paper, you know, I think she is very much, um, he's very much on the defensive, and he actually sees the situation worsening. But I don't think he has a way of. Uh, he, he, he can try to slow it. He can try to convince Biden that you know that salami slice recognition is is a bad idea, uh, but I think you know I think as Don said uh, the, the situation the grip on Taiwan is actually decreasing. Mm -hmm. Any further comments on that? I, I want to uh, add an, another comment. Uh, it's highly unusual uh, for. Uh, President Biden to have a slip of tongue 
or miss uh, speak five times in a row. I, I say that because uh, back in 2001, when President Bush Jr. told uh, a Good Morning America reporter that whatever it takes, you know, to defend Taiwan, Biden wrote that op-ed in Washington Post saying words carry meaning, you know, for President Bush to say, we're going to use military means to defend Taiwan, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And now he's doing exactly that. So you see the, 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 the big uh, change here, you know, while he was member of the Senate, you know, he understands perfectly the seriousness of Taiwan for any mainland Chinese leaders and, and for him to continue to make that statement, you know, in a very provocative way, it's, it's you know, I, I think it's a huge challenge uh, on, on the China side, how are you gonna respond uh, to, to this? And uh, so again, uh, I, I think this is the silver lining uh, for, for a, a lesson for, for China uh, and, and China has, I don't know, five or 10 years uh, to, to look at this, you know, if, if it's just another term, then, you know, 2027, that, that's the, over the weekend, there, there is a report, that's the CIA assessment. That's also the Joint Chiefs assessment. By 2027, China will be ready to take over Taiwan. That's also the, uh, the centennial of the People's Liberation Army. That's mm -hmm. also the end of the third term. So all these dates are, are coalescing uh, sort of to, to indicate that something may happen five years from now. Yeah. Although a lot can happen in five years. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, absolutely. I mean, particularly if the Chinese economy is slowing, there's more in, uh, dissatisfaction and so forth. Um, she could well be preoccupied for the next five years. And, um, you know, I, I didn't see the report on 2027. Um, probably should have. But, um, you know, if, if my generals come in and tell me if I give the order at seven o'clock in the morning, they'll have gotten the job done at four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I'm going to throw my generals out because I know they're bullshitting. Um, you know, there's no way there's no way that, that that's going to happen. Um, amphibious amphibious assault across 90 miles or 100 miles of open water. Phenomenally complicated. A million things can go wrong. And as I said before, the worst possible scenario for Xi Jinping or any Chinese leader is for all of those things to go wrong and the invasion fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was one sort of question and comment about that uh, uh, that uh, the person is asking, if China started a war with Taiwan and lost it, do you think it would be the end of Xi and the party? And you answered that, that, that Xi doesn't want that to happen. Um, but the person says that they think um, the the Chinese media could spin it as a that it wasn't completely a loss, you know, something like that. Which uh, I, that they could spin it, or we, the U.S. could spin it too, uh, just like the Korean War. But um, I would guess that she would probably have to step down in that scenario, right? be a little hard to spin the fact that after the conflict, Taiwan wasn't another province. Um, you know, you can spin what happened in the conflict, but you can't, uh, I don't know how you would spin the outcome on that. Um, and the, you know, this it gets back to my point is, yeah, I think she wouldn't do it just because you're probably right. It, it's not clear if he probably would have to go, but you know, uh, the other, uh, you know, the co other comrades in the party would have to worry that there'd be a nationalist backlash, you know, small mm -hmm. and nationalist, um, you know, that would that would severely undermine the party and add to this whole catalog of, of problems that it's facing now. So again, I, I, I think Chinese and Xi Jinping would end up being, uh, be, you know, I think they have to be very cautious. And certainly they do need to pressure the Taiwanese to remind everyone that, you know, we're not going to just walk away from this, but don't ever you know, I keep raising the ante, but don't ever call my bet. <laughs> Please.
it's a i mean it's it's hard to spin this one right because taiwan is probably it, it's unlikely that you'd end up with like half of Taiwan or a little bit of Taiwan, right? Russia can end up with the Crimea, Crimea and part of the Donbass and say, oh, we got what we wanted. Um, I mean, there, there are a couple little islands like Peng Chao that China could take and they could say, oh, we really wanted those. But like, it's going to be hard to spin, you know, um, because the territorial gain or loss should be or, or gain or lack thereof should be pretty, it will be probably pretty binary. Mm -hmm. Um. Good. Let's shift for a minute from from Taiwan and, and kind of go back to that uh, if we have a little bit more time, because there's still some questions on it. But I want to tee up um, from another perspective um, for a minute. And I'll ask one of my questions first, audience members, because we're all having similar questions. Um, Let's look at the historical relationship between Russia and China, because they've gone back and forth for as long as the CCP has been in charge of being friends, being enemies, being friends again, enemies again. Um, how long, what, what do we expect from this current relationship? What, are, what would be the triggers of it turning again to animosity? I always say there, there is no emotional foundation for a closer China-Russia relationship. So uh, Catherine, you mentioned about the history. I mean, the, the, the history of China-Russian relationship for, for, for China, it, it's a history of humiliation. You know, mm -hmm. Russia seized uh, so much territory uh, from China, uh, lending, you know, I think in, 1919, right after the Paris Peace Conference, you know, the, the, the Soviet foreign minister issued a, a declaration saying the Soviet Union was going to return all the territory to China. It, it never did. And, and of course, you know, China adopted the Russian political way of, of life. Uh, and and it, it hurt the Chinese nation, it hurt the Chinese people. I think the fact that Moscow and Beijing are closer now is, is basically a very cold fact that the Western leaders, and particularly the US now is doing everything to contain China. So mm -hmm. at, at this point, it doesn't make any sense for China to lose this important partner. I think the China's television anchor Liu Xin uh, send out a, a, a tweet basically saying, you want me to basically, you know, punish my friend and when my friend is gone, you're going to come over and you're going to strangle me to death. And and I, I think it's a very geopolitical calculation, regardless of what they say about, you know, this partnership sets up a new model, you know, it doesn't uh, target any third party. That, that That's all, you know, the cold uh, fact is, you know, China has to hedge. And, and there's no hope, at least for now, for Chinese leader to see US-China relationship is gonna improve. You know, it, all signals are pointing to a eventual decoupling in some of the areas, you know, and also there's a, always the Taiwan issue to have a Russia partner at, at this time makes sense. But, you know, they're, they're, they're not friends, you know, and, <laughs> and they don't share a lot either. And the Chinese parents do not want to send their kids to Russian universities and colleges, period. Mm, good and, point. And, and so US is partially responsible, although US does not want to see this kind of close relationship between Moscow and Beijing, but American leaders should be aware that they push the two countries closer. Yeah, that's a good comment and also answers one of the questions, which is, do you think that the U.S. is making things worse by also sanctioning um, Chinese companies and um, sort of the issues also around education as well? I think just really quickly to add on to Yoway's point, it's there's a certain incompatibility with the relationship because Russia wants to be treated as sort of a great power. And when it looks to Europe, it kind of gets to be treated as a great power. But, um, you know, the days of the Soviet Union are long gone and, and, it, and it isn't a great power compared to China or the United States anymore. 
and um, China's happy to treat it, you know, well, I think, but not like it's true great power equal, right? Um, so I think that there's a fundamental uh, tension uh, there. I, I'll agree with you already that, you know, the, the part of the problem is, is that with this kind of neo-containment policy by the United States with the, you know, the, the rhetorically, but also with the trade war and some of the you know, targeting of Chinese companies, um, you know, it, it, I think that reinforces the sense in Beijing is that the U.S. is not prepared to accept China as an equal. Uh, they are not prepared to, uh, as Galway said, they're not really prepared to go back toward a renormalization of the relationship, which of course would be, would be difficult. Um, and so I think what that, that leaves them with is, well, if the U.S. doesn't like us, uh, we need friends and the Russians are useful. They like to buy things from us. They produce uh, things that we, we like, oil, gas, uh, military equipment, et cetera. Um, so, so what's to lose from having a relationship with Russia? But I think at the same time, Yahweh is absolutely right. They do not see the Russians as their friends. Um, they don't see a certain compatibility. And I think, as John said, they see themselves as this number two power. And who is this, who is this Russia uh, over on the other side of the Great Wall? Uh, it's a second-rate power. And it's possible coming out of this this war, it'll be a third rate power. So, but you know, they may need friends, and so maybe we can ex exploit the relationship. But you know, we may date them, but we're not going to marry them. <laughs> yeah, and so one person was making the comment of uh, how does the party view um, Russia more more generally? Um, and, you know, I think the one strange thing that's happened over the past 50 years since, you know, the Soviet Communist Party doesn't exist anymore, I think, I'm not a Russia specialist, but so China is not dealing with another communist party in Russia, right? It's just an, a, another authoritarian country. So there's no political, I, there's no ideological reason for them to stick with Russia either, right? It's all practical. Well, the, the heyday of the Sino-Soviet dispute, they didn't have any, they didn't agree on ideology much. And I think, um, you know, I think in some ways the, the, the ideological question is, is quite interesting. Um, I think it's mostly aimed internally. I don't see the, the Chinese talking about an international communist movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's more about uh, trying to shore up the, uh, the party internally. So I think, I, you know, externally, I think they're just simply an authoritarian regime and as such are ideologically different from, from the Russians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. I want to read one of the questions. Um, this is also going back to the Ukraine issue. Is it possible that China will change its current balanced policy if Russia um, doesn't achieve its strategic goal eventually? Although we don't really know what Russia's strategic goal is, I believe, but um, let's say that Russia has to do a face-saving sort of, we got a little sliver of the Donbass, we're pulling out scenario. What would, would China sort of uh, dump Russia, I guess, to keep with the dating analogy? <laughs> I, I, I don't think China is going to dump uh, Russia. I, I, I think what happened at uh, the Shanghai Cooperation meeting uh, for now, I, I think it's uh, probably sufficient uh, for, for China to distance itself uh, from Russia. I, I don't think China is also going to change its normal, if we can use the word trade relationship uh, with, with Russia at this point. You know, China gets all the, all the uh, benefit. Russia's strategic goal is actually changing because of what happens on, on the battleground. The initial goal, of course, is to denazify and demilitarize the, the Ukraine. And then it had changed to 
you know, making the Donbass and Donetsk uh, area, you know, independent and defending these areas. Uh, it, it may, next week, it may change to uh, hanging on to Crimea. Uh, I, I think Ukraine probably now wants uh, all inch, every inch of territory, including Crimea to be, to be returned until they're going to start negotiating. Uh, but China can, uh, of course, you know, be vocal uh, again in terms of criticizing you know, using the means of war you know, to, to achieve uh, political means. You know, China can be a little bit more uh, critical, uh, but China, as long as US-China relationship is, is in this tailspin, uh, I, I, I don't think China is going to uh, distance itself too far, you know. Although uh, you know Russia may eventually become the third-rate power, you know it's not going to uh, mean a whole lot for for China. But still, uh, a, a friend uh, indeed uh, in need is is a friend indeed. Yes. Um, so, unless anyone else has more comments on that topic, I want to sort of switch switch again the. Um, questions. So there's there are two questions, um, and since we have about five minutes, oh, a little more than five minutes left, the answers I think are, are going to take a while because it's a it's a big topic and it has to do with uh, the changing world order. So the let's start with the more specific question, which is related to Taiwan, and the question is if the Taiwan Pol Policy Act is enacted in by the US, would that constitute a declaration of war by the US against China's sovereignty and territorial integrity? Um, and and would that do you think that would trigger a series of events, if we take that perspective, that would completely change the order of the world? Does that make sense? Uh, Andy, you want to go first? Predict, but... uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, yeah, the Taiwan Act. I, 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 I don't know what the significance of that really is in the long run, because mm -hmm. it doesn't really change U.S. policy in a, a fundamental manner. Um, or is it? Is it a sufficient red flag that? China has to do what it did in 1995 and 96 and to ratchet things way up, um, you know, to signal that, you know, we're not bluffing. Uh, we don't want, we are bluffing, but we don't want you to call, to call our bluff. But if you do do this, um, you know, it, it, it's going to have consequences. And does it, you know, if the act is passed, does, is there a crisis? Uh, lots of excitement, et cetera, and then it, we come out of it like we did 95, 96, understanding that strategic ambiguity in the status quo is preferable to definitive action in a high risk of uh, conflict, the outcome of which is hard to predict. I mean, how far up the ladder of escalation are the two sides willing to go in the event of a conflict? I mean, yeah. You know, China doesn't have a huge nuclear arsenal, but it has enough. Um, we have more than enough. Uh, we're not kind of like Mao, where he said, I think Mao said, you know, I, you, you, if you attack me and I lose uh, 300,000, I'll still have another uh, four or five, uh, excuse me, three, 300 million. I'll <laughs> still have 300 million. I don't know that. I don't know. Mao was as cavalier as he's. I don't uh, think that works anymore. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just, I don't, I don't know. You know, the, the question is, how far up would you go? How far? How? You know, what would a, what would a U.S.-China war look like? Um, it's not going to look like the Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to yeah. be much more serious. I, I don't know that either side is willing to go. You know. Risk it all on one, in, a, in effect, a roll of the dice. Uh, I don't think either side wants to do that. Mm -hmm. I I would hope the Chinese leadership basically see the Taiwan Policy Act as another uh, congressional uh, scheme uh, that is designed to to offend uh, China. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like the Chinese leadership uh, to read a commentary 
uh, by a, a Taiwan person who said uh, Senators Lindsey Graham and, and Bob Menendez traveled to Taiwan in April. When they came back, they issued a press uh, statement saying we want Taiwan to buy uh, Boeing uh, planes, you know, at about uh, $8 billion. And, and right before uh, the legislation was introduced, uh, uh, China Airline agreed to buy uh, about the same amount of money that the, the, the so-called Taiwan Policy Act is going to uh, sell the arms, you know, 4.5 billion worth of, of planes. So if China sees that as a quid pro quo, you know, not something really designed uh, to change the status quo. So you can desensitize yourself to this so that, you know, you can avoid another crisis. We, we don't, neither side is needing a crisis. And if you don't approach it as a crisis, it's not going to be a crisis. You know, Congress passed so many laws when Trump was the president. The Taipei Act actually is serious enough for many scholars to say that's already recognizing Taiwan as a legal and sovereign entity, but China didn't hype it up. Nothing happened. And now I see this tendency for the China side to cry, the wolf is, is coming. And, and I, I don't think this is a productive and healthy approach. You know, let, let it be, I agree with Andy. You know, what, what will this law really add? You know, what does that mean that Taiwan is a non-NATO ally? You know, does it really, does it really carry any weight? And you know, if it's not changing for the whole structure framework fundamentally, just you know, and and also of course you know the fact that whether it can become a law, still you know it's only out of the the Senate committee. The House side has taken no action, and whether the Republican will have enough vote you know to override a veto. There's so many unknowns. So at this time, just come on, give it a break. Don't talk about the fifth. Uh, or the sixth, you know, Taiwan Strait crisis. Yeah. The the one thing I would add to that is is if you want to look at something, I, I totally agree with both Andy and Yahweh that I don't think the Policy Act would, uh, even if it was passed, would probably change things that dramatically. If you want to look at something that would change things, I think we haven't talked at all about uh, Taiwan's um, prominence in mi microchip manufacturing, right? At Taiwan makes 60% of the world's microchips. Um, this makes it an incredibly dangerous place economically for uh, a war, um, if that starts to change, whether China starts to be able to make these chips itself or um, or they're starting to be made somewhere else, I think that would be um, a major factor that, that, that changes this. Um, there's lots of others, right? But I just wanted to bring that one up as one of the kinds of things that really does change the reality more than passing um, this or that bill, at least uh, by my estimation. I think it's, it's very hard to convince the Chinese that the Congress is basically a, is, you know, it's a useless body. It passed this useless legislation and likes to punch China in the nose. I mean, I literally have had people in Congress tell me, oh, well, this act, it'll give China a punch in the nose. And it's like, well, why do you want to give them a punch in the nose? Um, and it's mostly, you know, for domestic political politics. politics. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think I think it's hard to convince the Chinese whose uh, National People's Congress doesn't do things unless it's okay with the leadership that, in fact, the administration doesn't control Congress and doesn't control its own the members of its own party in Congress. And, you know, that Nancy Pelosi can pull off this stunt of going to Taipei and literally Biden can't stop her and at the end of the day probably didn't want to stop her because it, it's useful for him to punch china in the nose for political reasons as well um yes the the whole um on from both sides the whole po political grandstanding for domestic politics is uh interesting but also kind of annoying but um so the last question which is on the lines of those uh, that is also about uh you know the international rules and um the the world order so um person that asked this question i want to change your question slightly um 
because we haven't talked about regional um, regional issues or, and regional movements like the Quad and how that um, has impacted, you know, all of that is coming out of the Ukraine actions, but, and is that going to create blocks? Um, how strong is, do you guys perceive the, you know, US, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam versus China, Russia into the future? So this person is worried about a potential Cold War, another Cold War in the future with these blocks. I mean, I just think with the given the current levels of international economic integration, it's much less likely, right? I mean, the thing that made the Cold War possible was there was this Soviet economic sphere and this Western economic sphere, and they just, they operate independently. And now they're so intertwined, it would mean a massive reorganization of the world's economy. If something sparks that, then I think that maybe uh, becomes possible again. But um, I, I think in short of that, economic integration makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think what China should do uh, in response uh, to Quad, uh, to uh, you know AUKUS and 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 other you know these new alignment that are designed to contain China is to join as many trade organizations as possible. China is already part of Lisa. You know China has applied uh, to join CPTPP. You know China should basically use your economic leverage, uh, hopefully you know to basically uh, make these militarized uh, partnership you know meaningless you know that that's what uh, mm -hmm. china should do if china can turn shanghai cooperation organization also into a economic you know free trade uh, organization i mean that that that's great otherwise you know shanghai cooperation organization is just it's just an organization that talks uh, but you know nothing really uh, fo follows you know, what they have agreed to do. So th I, I think that's the best approach. You know, although US is hoping uh, Quad will become NATO uh, in, in Asia, but, you know, India, I don't think India is gonna play ball and, mm -hmm. and, and, and China can easily, easily, you know, just get all the people together, you know, to make money together is so much better than to make war against each other. Yeah, I I'll agree with both of you, uh, both of you that um, you know there was no couple between the uh, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the Eastern Bloc and, and NATO. So it was easy to have a Cold War. Um, you know, it almost was by definition you had two two separate camps. The the downside of a real breakdown of China's economic relationship with the U.S. would have catastrophic results on both sides. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think we saw a little bit from the Trump's trade war in terms of the disruption of trade. We saw a great deal of it more because of COVID. Um, and the last thing that, that Biden needs or she needs is to add a breakdown in U.S.-China trade to the list of other problems they get. Because, you know, cause massive unemployment in China, massive inflation in the United States, worsening of supply chain, supply chain worsening leads to you know, redoubling of inflation, uh, loss of income, and it complicates the Chinese real estate market. So I agree with Yale. I mean, what China should do is trade, 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 should negotiate with everyone possible to make it unambiguously clear about the interdependence of the world. And the, the folly of having a cold war between the two largest powers in the world uh, with the two largest economies in the world. So, you know, I, I think, you know, the optimistic side would be that she and Trump, she and uh, Biden would sit down together and they would say, OK, we've had our differences, but now let's 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 get back to a modus vivendi that we have to get back to. Modus. We don't like you. And, you know, there's the question of Xinjiang and all of those things that, but we can't, we can't let this get worse. Um, because, not because we agree on a lot, but because it would hurt us so badly economically and in domestic politics that these are catastrophic results that would not be good for either of us. Yeah. 
And, and I think just uh, to, to the point that the, the pain point in the United States, we saw this a little during the trade war, the particular people that are most hurt are um, uh, demographics whose political voices are amplified through things like the Electoral College and the Senate, right? There are a lot of uh, farmers in smaller rural states, um, right? So you have to think about also the, the sort of domestic politics. We tend to think, oh, it'll be, you know, big American businesses in New York and California that are hurt by trade war with China. Well, actually, uh, a lot of the worst of it is soybean farmers, and China knows this and knows how to target them specifically, right? Although that was that was true during the Trump administration, and it didn't seem to actually lead places like Nebraska and Iowa to turn blue. They <laughs> stayed red. So the question would be then, how much? I mean, how much pain would it really take? in order for uh, people to actually realize that uh, I may love Trump, but I love my income better and my income is tied to China. Um, that, that's a complicated, uh, complicated scenario. Yes, so we're a little bit over time at the moment, but let's end if each of you could kind of make a couple of sentence comment of uh, you know, and we've gotten way beyond our topic, um, which I think is good in a way of, of what has China learned from the Ukraine. Um, so, could John, I, start. Oh, sorry. So no, could I, could I actually pose? Well, okay, I'll, I'll, oh. I'll use my time to, to more to pose a question uh, <laughs> to my panel, uh, uh, my colleagues on the panel. Um, uh, and thank you uh, so much, uh, Kathy, for um leading us, which is which is far harder than it looks, believe me, and you've done an excellent job. Um, but there was a an interview of Michael Beckley, the professor at Tufts on um, NPR a few weeks, three or four weeks ago, I don't know if anyone saw it, but everyone started asking me about it. And one of the things he says is, you know, China, uh, kind of China's invasion of Taiwan is getting more likely as China enters decline. And I think this was a fascinating statement to me, the idea that somehow uh, the U.S. wasn't the country in decline. China was the country in decline. And I'm not necessarily saying that's not true. Um, but I think uh, I, I bring this up for two reasons, both because I, I really genuinely want to hear what Andy Yale would have to say if they'll sacrifice a little bit of their time to answer it. But also because I think it, it tells us so much about how our perspective shapes our view of this issue, right? Is the United States the superpower in decline or is China the power in decline? Is... Um, you know, uh, is this a, the framework of a new Cold War? Is it is it economic? Is it political? Is it domestic politics? Is it classic IR theory, right? Um, so I just think we have so many lenses, we have to really um, be cognizant of, of what kind of uh, biases, tools, and lenses we're bringing at this, because I'm um, as guilty as anyone about getting, um, you know, coming from my individual perspectives. So uh, that maybe that was a little bit too meta, but um, mm -hmm. but thank you guys all so much for this. And thank you. That was a great last comment. Um, but I'll just ask if Yahweh and Andy have um, any response to that. Yeah, I, I, I'm quite uh, concerned uh, by what uh, John mentioned, you know, the Michael Beckley, uh, Ryan Haas, uh, and George Will of Washington Post. They're all making the same argument that, you know, China Contrary to what the Chinese are saying, that time and momentum on our side, China has entered a real and meaningful decline. And because China is declining, according to the political science theory, uh, a declining power is always reckless and, and seeking confrontation. I think uh, Andy referred to that as using the war as, as a diversion when you know, popular discontent is, is, is raising. You know, we really don't know what's going on in China, but you know, China is facing uh, serious uh, challenges and economic, political, social, you know, they're, they're all there. But to fight a war at this time, as was suggested by many of the American political scientists, I, I, I think you know, it, it's disastrous, it's catastrophic, and uh, Chinese people on both sides of the street have enough wisdom to figure out that they can find a way. They don't have to kill each other. Uh, and and uh, that, that's what I hope. And uh, uh, I, I think um, Americans, regardless how they want the two sides to go to war, I, I really think many Americans think, you know, to contain China, 
the most effective way is to get China to use force against Taiwan. Look at what is happening to Russia, that the same thing will happen to China. So I, I hope the Chinese leaders are going to be patient. They're going to be you know, rational. Uh, they're, they're going to basically focus on doing what the Chinese leadership has done uh, in the past 43 years, you know, improving the living conditions of the Chinese people, make the Chinese people happy, make each and every one Chinese happy. It's far more important than the so-called national rejuvenation. Yeah, I think I think John raises a, a good point because if you look at the figures, the Chinese economy has been slowing down for a number of years, um, and so it. To me, it seems pretty clear that the, the go-go days of the 80s, the 90s, and the early uh, 2000s are gone. And this does create uh, the problem for, as, as Yahweh points out, of maintaining peace, prosperity, and a, at least a semblance of justice, um, which are the three legs of what I, the, what I think of as the three legs of the mandate of heaven. Um, I think, you know, is, 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 is the the heady days of double digit growth become something in the past. Um, the ramifications in terms of China's domestic politics uh, really begin to create a situation where uh, peace becomes paramount and not and avoiding a conflict with China. You've got to deal with all of these uh, economic, these employment problems, uh, et cetera. And uh, while IR theory likes to theorize about declining powers, uh, de depending on the uh, you know, latching out and so forth, um, the data tends to be somewhat ambiguous. Um, that in fact, the, the declining hegemon, uh, we certainly see some examples, but you know, given this, you know, that the past of the international system was one of economic independence and limited trade and is now dominated by massive global trade and uh, economic interdependence. I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, domestic concerns begin to overshadow uh, foreign concerns. And I think as long as Beijing believes that it can continue to say that Taiwan is not an independent country, it's not a member of the UN, ergo, it is part of our, um, it's part of our, you know, national heritage. As long as they can continue to spin that story, war is just not, an op not, not a good option. Great. Um, so we're quite a bit over now and thanks everyone in uh, you know that's 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 hung on a long time. We've really maintained our our um, numbers during the this chat. So hopefully we will do another one like this in the next couple of months towards the end of the year. And I want to thank all the panelists for writing their papers and joining in on this um, topic.